Hello students, I'm Matthew Wilson and I will be your economics professor for this semester. So today is the first day of class. We'll spend some time looking at course policies and then we'll get started on the main material. Because this is a very unusual semester and online class, we'll probably take a bit more time talking about course policy than I would normally, but there's still going to be some space for the main material to get started. So mostly what I'll do is I'll be uploading videos in advance. You can then watch them on your own time. There will be some incentives in place to make sure you do watch them on time and don't fall too far behind. So with that little introduction out of the way, we'll go and turn over to the slides. The class is Principles of Microeconomics. I'll tell you a little bit about what that means, a little bit about my background before I go into the course policies. So I grew up in Washington State. I went to grad school in Oregon. Then I worked for four years in Missouri at Truman State University. I spent one year over here, so this is now year number two up in New York at Binghamton University. I've researched a lot of different areas. The most exciting project, I think, is one about self-fulfilling prophecies and the money supply. I have this analogy with my research and a solar eclipse. So we actually had a solar eclipse in Missouri back when I was um, doing some of the work for that project. Here is a photo of that. Unfortunately, we had a thunderstorm at the same time, so it was cloudy and you couldn't actually see the eclipse. It was a bit darker than it normally would have been at around 1 p.m. when this photo was taken. The t-shirts that I sold show you what a solar eclipse looks like. It basically means the moon blocks out the sun, so you have a couple minutes of night during the daytime. Now, back in ancient times, people often attached great significance to events they saw in the sky. So if some ancient village had seen a solar eclipse that's seen nighttime during a the day, they might be perplexed as to what this signifies. They would assume it has some kind of importance for things down here on Earth. So perhaps they go and they consult with their wise men and elders and ask them, what does this sign mean? What's going on up there in the clouds, in the sky? And perhaps the wise men and elders go and consult with themselves and they decide this is a sign that disaster is coming to our village. Perhaps as a consequence of that, people stop buying as much as they used to. Maybe they start trying to save more so if things go wrong, they can just dip into their savings and hang on that way. The big problem with that though is that if everyone just stops buying all at once, then you get a major recession. Kind of like we saw here at the coronavirus, not that long ago. People stop buying, the economy goes down. So the wise men and elders predicted a recession and sure enough, recession came. Now, of course, when we're enlightened these days, we know that solar eclipses don't actually cause recessions. However, there still are a lot of things that are very mysterious to us in the present times. So when the Federal Reserve does something with the money supply, we go and consult our wise men and elders, or I think they're called economists these days. We consult our economists and ask them, what does that mean? Perhaps our economists tell us this will cause recession, or our economists tell us this will lead to good times. Just as the solar eclipse led to a recession in the ancient village, so also could the predictions of economists lead to recessions and booms in present times? Prophecies can be self-fulfilling. So that's a bit about some of the stuff that I do. Now let's go talk more about the course. So there are two main branches in economics, macroeconomics and microeconomics. So macro is about the whole economy, the economy for an entire nation. Microeconomics is, is looking at individuals and firms and industries. It's a much smaller scope. 
and the things that we analyze. So the way I keep them straight and not mix them up, if I want to look at something small, I use a microscope. So micro has to be the small one. The other part of the course title is Principles of Microeconomics. By principles, I mean we're looking at the most basic stuff. We're going to save the more advanced things for Intermediate Micro, which is the next course in this series. So a lot of times you'll hear me say something like, this definition is not entirely precise. You'll hear more about that later on. What I mean is that I'm simplifying a bit for this course, but the more advanced stuff will be revealed in Intermediate Micro and sometimes beyond that. So here's a table I borrowed from your textbook clarifying the distinction between microeconomics and macro. They study many of the same topics, but at different scales. So let's say we want to talk about income. A microeconomist looks at things in a small scale, so they look at the income of a person or a firm's income. A firm's income is called revenue. A macroeconomist cares about income for the entire country. If you want to talk about output, a microeconomist talks about a single firm's output or a single worker's output, how much they're producing. A macroeconomist cares about an entire nation's production. A microeconomist cares about the employment for individual or for a firm. Macroeconomists care about the overall country's unemployment rate. Microeconomists care about the price of single goods and single services. Macroeconomists care about the overall price level and inflation. So many of the same subjects, but microeconomists are small scale and macroeconomists are large scale. <coughs> All right, let's get into the syllabus. So I don't think I can do office hours face-to-face -face because of the pandemic, so I'll hold office hours over Zoom. I'll do that from 8 p.m. to 9 p.m. on Wednesdays. So shortly before the Zoom office hours, I'll post a link on my courses where you guys can follow that and join the Zoom meeting. So Zoom is just if you have extra questions you want to ask because you want to just talk about econ in general, you're welcome to show up to that. You don't need an appointment. Just click on the link and we can chat. So some of the course rules. Um, I'm a visiting professor. That means they give me more courses than the other professors and they also give me bigger courses than the other professors. I have almost 300 students in total. If all of you guys email me, it's going to get pretty overwhelming. I won't be able to get work done if I have a gigantic amount of email in my inbox every day. So it's very important that you send all your email to the TA. Your TAs know a lot about economics. They can answer a lot of your questions. For things that they cannot resolve, they can forward it to me. So for those questions, even then, you don't email me. You email them and they forward it. So you go to me indirectly. Now you can show up to the Zoom office hours and ask me questions there. Again, without an appointment. The Zoom office hour is only one hour a week, so that keeps the workload manageable. Emails can just devour your time, so emails to go to the TAs first. So I have two main sections of principles, and that's split into eight discussion sections. So depending upon which subsection you're in, you can see your TA's name and their email listed here. Your TA also has control over their own my courses page and they'll be posting announcements and stuff over there as well. So some of these sections are going to be fully online. Some are going to have a face-to-face -face component. The main lecture that I'm doing is going to be all online. Your TA should post an announcement shortly about if it's going to be all online or partly face-to-face, -face, partly online. If it is online, if it's going to be asynchronous, so they'll upload videos in advance, you watch them whenever you want, or if it's going to be synchronous. So you have to tune at the specific time in order to see the content. So the main class is going to be 
mostly asynchronous. I post videos in advance, you watch them whenever. We'll talk more about that shortly. Now the exceptions to the class being asynchronous are going to be for the exams and for the exam practice sessions. So here are the exam dates. We have one in week five. And I have another exam up in week 10, so it's going to be spread out throughout the semester. And a final exam is going to be posted, the times we post it later. So first I figure out after the ad drop deadline, who's going to be which classes and they design the final exam schedule to minimize conflicts. So once I know when the final exam is going to be, I'll post an announcement about that. So because it's an online class, it's going to be difficult to monitor for cheating. So there's going to be a lot of anti-cheating incentives in place for those tests. So the first thing I do is that, um, well, for the format, the exams will all be multiple choice and they'll all be up on my courses. The exams will have two sections. So one section is going to be easy to moderate questions. The other question is going to be, section is going to be harder questions. So the anti-cheat incentives are going to be as follows. The questions will be drawn at random from a large pool of potential questions. That means that everyone's exam is going to look a little bit different. Why do I do that? Well, what I'm trying to do is discourage you from cheating off your classmates. So if your classmate has a different exam, and you're trying to work with them, working together is not going to do any good because you have different questions in front of you. There's no benefit to working together, and working together is not allowed. The other thing we do is that we have no backtracking on exams. What that means is that once you submit your answer to question one and move on to question two, you can't go back to question one and change your answer. That is also designed to discourage you guys from cheating off each other. So perhaps your question one could be your friend's question five. If you could just flip through all the exam questions, you could see the overlap there then work on question one slash five together and get an unfair advantage. But if you can't move on to the next question without finalizing your answer, then you can't just slip through all the questions and find overlap. That's another very standard anti-cheating mechanism. Not just a rule in this class, but a rule that you'll find in many online classes as well. The exams are timed. Because I can't supervise you, I can't stop you from looking at your notes and stuff like that. However, because of the time limit, you will find yourself better off if you know it all the material in your head rather than having to consult your notes. If you keep having to go back and forth to your notes, that's going to lose time and you might find yourself bumping up against the exam time limit and not completing the last couple of questions. So if, you, if you're honest, I'm, I'm sure the, most, the large majority of you guys are, and you just play by the rules, you don't cheat, you'll be fine. I'm just going through this for all your benefit just to assure you that cheating's not going to be a big problem here. People probably, who are going to try to cheat will probably just end up hurting themselves and not profiting from it. So those are the um, exam policies. The other 10% of your grade comes from my courses online homework. So about once a week, I'll be posting homework on my courses and it'll all be multiple choice and you'll be submitting that to get credit. The first one is not due until, um, hang on a moment, I got my notes here. Not due until September 13th. That's week three. I did that because the ad drop deadline is not until September 8th. Someone could conceivably enter the class at the last minute, and I don't want to have them miss a homework and already be on 0%, already missing stuff before they've even started the class, before they've even had a chance to start. So that's why 
homework one is in week three. Now, I always get a lot of excuses about late homework, and I've only allowed two exemptions in my entire 10-year career. So the first exemption, I had a student who, was, who seemed pretty healthy, and he suddenly needed heart surgery one day. So that's a pretty extreme emergency. So I gave him a pass on a homework assignment. The second exemption I granted was one student who had a pretty bad case of the coronavirus last semester. And her whole family got it, and it was pretty bad. So a general rule is that if you're not having heart surgery, I expect you to complete the homework on time, no excuses. I strongly urge you, that's why I put things in italics here, to start your homework early. That way if something comes up, you can still do it on time. So things like um, things like if your internet's kind of unreliable one day, if you're doing things last minute, that could cost you the assignment. If you're doing your homework two days early and your, and your internet's been a bit wobbly, then it's gonna come back on tomorrow and be stable and reliable. And then you can submit it then and you're fine. Or things like that, some unexpected thing like me have to go to work by surprise your boss changes your schedule. If you're doing things last minute, that could cost you a homework assignment. If you're doing things several days in advance, you're still okay and do things on time. So only in the most extreme conditions do we exempt you from homework. Do things early so you can get things on time, even if there's a surprise. I'm going to lead here by example. I don't have to post this video until the first day of class, which will be on um, for you guys, it will be Thursday the 27th. I'm actually recording this on the 24th. So that way, if something weird happens to my internet or something goes wrong with my video editing software, this video will still appear on time or even early. So similar policy applies to exams. I don't um, allow makeup exams except under extreme crises like heart surgery. So just plan on doing things on time and be prepared. Now, the very last part of your grade breakdown is that, um, oh, one last thing. So if you do have some valid exemption, I will expect you to show proof. So if you have heart surgery, then you'll be able to show me some documents from the hospital proving you had heart surgery. If you had a really bad case of the coronavirus, you can show me your hospital records and stuff like that. So it has to be an extreme crisis and you have to have proof. There's also extra credit for our compliance syllabus policy. So just follow the rules and you get a free point. So the rules say email TA first. So email TA first, don't email me so I don't get overwhelmed. Rules also say don't ask about late homework unless you really have some extreme crisis like heart surgery. So don't ask about that and you get extra credit. So the course is mostly asynchronous. You can watch the videos when you want to, not necessarily at the class time. The problem that I created last semester is that there's a lot of procrastination. These are my video statistics for the um, number of views from last semester. You can tell where midterm two was. It was right over here. And here was the final exam. So you can see a lot of students didn't watch the videos at all until it was the last minute. That's called cramming, and cramming is bad for your long-term retention. So we have some incentives in place to encourage you to stay on track with watching the videos. So in order to open your homework assignment, you're gonna need the homework password. That password is going to be in the subtitles to one of the videos. So I can tell you in advance it's not in this video, so don't worry if you did not have the subtitles on. But in one of the other videos, I won't specify which one, so you watch all of them. In one of the other videos, there will be a homework password in the subtitles. So just get in the habit of always turning the subtitles on when you watch the videos so that you don't miss the homework password. It's going to flash across the, across the screen somewhere in the bottom for about five or ten seconds. So you want to keep your eyes on the screen, not be distracted. 
when you're watching the videos and that way you won't miss the password so your big takeaway be responsible watch the videos on time and do your homework on time and you'll be in good shape so I talked about the um, anti-cheating policies already and that no law exemptions for the most extraordinary of crises so I have gotten some questions already about the restarting Binghamton this class is all online so a lot of that does not apply to this class they do have an FIQ for a lot of the other questions I've gotten so do familiarize yourself with that so I realize we do have a very diverse audience here. Some of you are not in the US when you're watching this video. Now, some countries do censor websites and those websites may include websites with course materials. The way to get around that is to use a virtual private network, also called a VPN. Here's the link here to Binghamton's VPN. So you can use that to get access to all this stuff. I post practice problems before the exams. There's a lot of resources in place to help you succeed on the tests. So I post practice problems. And I also have a practice session. The practice session will be done synchronously on the class prior to the exam. So we have our first exam on September, on September 24th, on a Thursday. Our practice session will be Tuesday at 22nd. So what way it's going to work is I'll give you multiple choice questions. They'll be timed just like the exam is, and it'll be a smaller sample in the exam. It would not be a full exam length, and that'll be the first half of it. In the second half of the practice session, I'll post a video where I go over the answers. So it's trying to mimic the exam format so that you have an idea of what you'll be getting into. Now, many of you guys are coming here fresh out of high school. College is not the same as high school. So I think high school is pretty great inflated. If you're trying to maintain the same grades in college as you had in high school, it's a noble goal, but you'll find it requires a lot more work. So just be upfront about that so you're not in for a big surprise when you realize how much, how many hours it'll take to master principles of economics. So here's a brief outline of the course chapters. The first thing you'll do is talk about some economic basics. These chapters, chapter one, two, and these five foundations of economics will be used not just in this class in micro, but you'll also see them in a principles of macro class. Remember micro is about small scale and macro is large scale. You also see model building gains from trade in macro as well. So after that, I go a bit out of order. Before looking at supply and demand, which will be hugely important in this course, I take a detour through consumer choice. That's because demand in a market comes from consumers. And I want to tell you guys about consumer behavior first so you know where demand is coming from. Supply comes from producers. And that's going to be a similar process. We go more in depth on that later on. So once we get a basic handle on how markets work, we'll look at something called elasticity. That's how responsive markets are to different kinds of conditions. We'll get more specific about that later. Next, we'll look at government interventions in marketplaces. So when is government intervention justified? When can government policies improve market outcomes? And when is it harmful? Then we'll look at the supply side. The supply side gets a lot more chapters because there's a lot of different possibilities there. There are different market structures. On one hand, you have something called perfect competition, where you have a huge number of firms all competing with each other. We'll get more specific in that definition later on. On the other end of the spectrum, you have a monopoly where there's only one firm and there's no competition at all. There are also intermediate cases. So one intermediate case is oligopoly, where you have a handful of small firms. 
Another intermediate case is something called monopolistic competition, where there's a large number of small firms. So the market structure will have some important implications for our analysis. So we'll talk more about those implications later on. So once we get done with that, we'll look at a couple of special topics. So resources can provide some exceptions to the rules we learned about earlier. So we'll spend a chapter talking about those. So for example, the supply of land is fixed. You generally can't produce more land. That's different from most other goods. If you want to produce more, uh, if you want to produce more bananas, you can grow more bananas. So most goods do not have a fixed supply, but land is different. We'll also look at this field of behavioral economics, which is a growing field and one that I've also done some research in. I have two papers published in that area. Behavioral economics challenges some of the assumptions we make in more standard economics. So we'll look at the evidence on some of the assumptions we'll generate in the first part of the course, and we'll see do those assumptions stand up to scrutiny as well as some of the alternatives out there in chapter 17. So that's our introduction to the course. Be sure to tune in for our next episode and turn on the subtitles when we go look at some of the course material in chapter one. Take care and stay safe out there.